Good morning, Grace Church family. Welcome to Mother's Day Sunday as we just come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. Join us as we sing 10,000 Reasons. Good morning. Good morning, Grace Church. It's uh, Sunday. It's Mother's Day today. Probably the most unusual Mother's Day of our lifetimes. We're, we want to, this morning, honor women that have served as mothers in our lives in, in various kind of ways. And I hope and I pray that today uh, you're able to express that honor and those, that gratitude uh, to women who have served in different ways in, in mothering in your life. And I pray there'll be opportunities to, uh, to express that and to receive that and to celebrate uh, women who have served us in that way as our, as our mothers, as our guides, as our teachers. So thank you and, and happy Mother's Day. Let's begin our worship together uh, with this call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. In our anguish, we cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting us free. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
His love endures forever. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We will not die, but live. And we'll proclaim what the Lord has done. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God greets us this morning. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Everybody. Miss Natalie here. Today, while I'm recording this, the sun is shining. Yesterday, the sun was shining, even though it snowed a little bit. And I don't feel like talking as much. I feel like singing. I feel like singing one of our favorite children's worship songs. 
So if you're home, usually get on the floor or somewhere where you still have a lap to clap, because this might give you a hint. We're going to do Jesus Loves Me all three ways. And remembering that this is an action song, so we explain some of the words with our hands. And that's because God gave us voices to praise him, but God also gave us bodies, and we can use our bodies to praise him and to in worship of him. So let's go. Jesus loves me all three ways. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, one, two, three. Jesus loves me, four, five, six. Jesus loves me, seven, eight, nine. Jesus loves me all the time. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You guys getting ready for rock and roll? All right. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Singing na 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 na. Hey na 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 na. Who na 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 na. Hey na 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 na. Who. That felt really good. It felt really good to be doing. One of our favorite songs. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Because now we're going to move into our story. Just like we do in children's worship, we're going to go from big songs and we're going to bring it down by singing the song that we always sing before we listen to the story. And it reminds us that we're about to hear a story from the Bible and that we should try to be quiet while I tell the story. And we keep our hands and feet to our own body so we don't distract anyone who is with us. Let's sing. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. So this is the Sea of Galilee. After Jesus died and God made him alive again, Jesus told his disciples to return to the Sea of Galilee, that he would meet them there. One evening, seven of the disciples went fishing. And when they went fishing, they would do it at night. So they went out onto the sea, and they fished all night long. A 
all night long. They threw the net over and brought it in, and it was empty. Just after sunrise, they saw somebody on the shore. He called out to them, have you caught any fish? No, they yelled back. Cast the net to the other side of the boat and you'll find some, he said. So they did. Well, they brought up so many fish and they couldn't haul it onto the boat. Then someone said, oh, Is that Jesus? Well, Peter jumped out of the boat and ran to Jesus. The rest of them took the boat back dragging the fish behind them. When they got there, they saw a fire with some bread and some fish. Come and eat, Jesus said. It really was Jesus. So, they had breakfast together. And it was good. I wonder if the disciples had missed fishing for fish, because that's what a lot of them did for a living before Jesus said, come, I will make you fishers of people. I wonder if they missed fishing for fish. I wonder what they talked about that night on the boat. I wonder what it feels like to work all night and catch nothing. I know some of you are fishers, so you know what it's like to fish for a while and not get a lot of bites. I wonder what it's like all night. I wonder why the disciples keep being surprised to see Jesus. I wonder what's surprising about Jesus, even when he promises, go to see Galilee, I'll meet you there. They're still surprised. I wonder why Jesus keeps feeding people. I wonder if you've ever had fish and bread for breakfast. I have. It's usually a bagel with smoked salmon on it. I wonder if you don't like fish, would you still eat it if Jesus was the one who gave it to you? I wonder if that would make a difference. I wonder what they talked about while they had breakfast with Jesus there on the beach next to the sea. That's our story. Thanks for listening. Let's join our hearts together uh, in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we give thanks to you for this day. We give thanks to you for this Sabbath day, this day in which we can uh, gather together in this, in this way, in this virtual way. We can worship you together. We can hear from you again today. And Lord, as we look together at your word and, and think about your promises to us, uh, may we be renewed today. May we be strengthened today. May our fears be relieved today. We thank you for this day, another day of life, a gift from you. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you today for mothers everywhere. 
We give thanks for their love and care, concern, their compassion. We, we honor them today. We, we lift to you those especially who have struggled in their roles as mothers, where the path has not been smooth. We, we pray for those who have failed in, in some ways, which all of us do. We, we, pray, we pray that you'll bring hope in the midst of, midst of our lives, whether as mothers or as children. For those relationships that have become strained, we pray that you will grant reconciliation. Where there is pain, we pray for the healing of your grace and your mercy. For those who have been unable to have their own children or have lost children, Lord, fill their hearts with your amazing love. Uh, bless their ministry in their roles of being mothers to others. And, and, and as we reflect on our own lives, may our hearts overflow in gratitude to all that have served and, and invested and loved and cared for us. Lord, we, we, we bring up our needs to you. Lord, overwhelmingly, we feel uh, the presence of this coronavirus with us. It's brought in us fears. It, it is pointed out again, the disparity that exists in our country between uh, the haves and the have-nots. It, it pointed out the disparity that exists uh, among races in this country. And Lord, we, we, we pray for justice, and we pray for peace, and we pray for a, a new beginning that comes out of this difficult time. We, we pray, O oh Lord, for the Ohamed Aubrey, Aubrey uh, murders, for the murderers, for those who have um, acted out and done this horrible thing. Lord, we pray, for, we pray that the truth will come out and, and that justice will be, justice will be done. We pray for healing in our country of these racial disparities, hatreds. We pray for the end of racism. We pray more and more, Lord, for the fruit of the Spirit to show itself in our lives and in, and in our nation. We pray for the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Lord, we acknowledge that, that patience is, is, is something that we need from you. We, we, need a, we need the emotional calm in, in the face of what we are dealing with today. Help us to be calm without, without complaint or, or irritation. Many of us, Lord, are living on the edge, under too much pressure, with too much to do, with not enough to do it. Tears are just below the surface. Tears are on the surface of our cheeks. Our children, oh God, don't understand what's going on. We don't understand what's going on. And we can't reach out with, with a hug. We can't imagine living much longer without a hug from our loved ones. Too many of us are alone and lonely. Too many of us need a, a quiet space in, in, the, in the chaos that exists now in our homes with everyone being together. Lord, patience is far from us. Be patient with us, Lord, on days when we, when we are not exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Grant us, Lord, an extra measure of your Spirit in these difficult times. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, and faithfulness. May, may this fruit more and more become ours. And, and as it does, may it bring fruitful hope to the lives of those around us. Thank you for all that you are in our lives. Thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We give you thanks and praise in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's all sing this meditative song together. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me.
reading today is from Psalm 3. Listen to God's word. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. All the way through, we'll sing, You Are Sealed About Me. People of grace, we have switched gears a bit. We have, we have put the series of sermons that we were working through from the book of Acts uh, on hold for a time. And I, and I wanted us to focus more on what we're dealing with today and, and what we're feeling today. I wanted us to think of, about our, the needs that we're, that we're experiencing today as we go through this health crisis together. Last week, we looked at Psalms 39 and 126 and thought together about our prayer lives as we go through times of sadness and grief and tears. The Psalms, we said, are, are deeply emotional and brutally honest prayers. And we're, we're taken back sometimes by the, by the honesty of the prayers. They, they often say things that we would not dare say out loud. We'd think them maybe, but probably not say them. And 
And that's helpful. That's helpful to us, I think. Look at, look at verse 7 here. Such, such brutal honesty. You know, it makes us squirm a little bit, right? You know, break the jaw. Smash the teeth of my enemy. That doesn't seem to fit with an overarching message of, of the scriptures, right? It doesn't fit with Jesus teaching us to love our enemies. To the best of my knowledge, Jesus never said anything like, break the jaw, smash the teeth of my enemies. The, the Psalms are saying, I, I know that this is not politically correct. I know that this isn't right. But man, I'm angry. The Psalms are, are raw. They're intense. They, they can make us feel uncomfortable. The, the Psalms give us a unique approach for dealing with the raw emotions that we feel. We, we, we said this last week. We don't deny our emotions. Try to, we don't try to stuff down our emotions. We don't act as if nothing bad is, is happening, as if we don't act as if nothing is wrong. We also do not embrace our emotions and live out of our emotions. We're not controlled by our, emo our emotions. We shouldn't be denying them or, or just indiscriminately venting them. We, we should be praying them. We should bring our emotions before God in prayer. We should process what is happening with us honestly before God in prayer. The Psalms show us that we can be brutally honest in, in our prayers before God, who is our Father. We thought last, we thought last week about tears, about sorrows, about, about grief, and, and bringing those emotions of sadness before God. And this morning, I want to think with you about our fears. We are all today dealing with fear. We're all dealing with our uncertainties. There's, those fears are legitimate. We have fears for our health. We have fears over our finances and our futures. We have fears about our family. We even have fears about whether we'll even see members of our family again. Fear is, is a basic emotion that we experience even in, even in good times, and certainly we are experiencing it today. I had a grandson born in March. His name is James. Our son John and daughter-in-law Courtney, sadly for us, right after his birth, moved to Villa Park, Illinois. But I thought about a baby being born. The, the birthing experience must be a shock for a baby. And I think there's probably fear as a part of the birthing experience for the baby. The baby comes out thinking, where are those warm, soft walls? Why is it so cold? Who's grabbing me? Hey, why are you hitting me? What's going on? This is the way that we come into the world. I think that fear is a part of it. Fear probably is the first emotion that we feel in life. And, and I think we continue to feel it, continue to feel it to the end. Fear is a part of human life from the beginning to the end. Amen? And here in this text, David, the author of the psalm, is afraid I want to show you that there's different types of fear and different levels to fear, different ways in which we fear. First, David has literal, literal armies after him. He has thousands of people after him trying to capture him and to kill him. And in the middle of the psalm, David prays, I, I will not fear. I sleep in the midst of these armies. Psalm 3 is David praying his fear, bringing and processing his fear before God. He says, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? How many are saying of, of, of me, God will not deliver him? What I want you to see here is that there are two different kinds of fears that are here in this text, here in this verse that, that I just read. First, the most immediate fear is that David's own son Absalom has declared himself king. He's, he started a coup against his father, the king. David, uh, Absalom declared himself king, and David is here fleeing for his life. There are, there are armies after him to kill him. David is experiencing what men might do to him. He says, many are my foes, many are my foes. Sometimes paranoid people are right. I tell Eileen from time to time, 
that I wouldn't be so paranoid if everyone wasn't against me. Here's one of those places. David is saying, everybody is after me. Tens of thousands of people are after me. And you know what? He's right. They're after him. Tens of thousands of people are after him to, to capture him, imprison him, and kill him. He's not being paranoid here. This is a legitimate fear. And, and that, kind of, that kind of imminent harm, that fear of imminent harm, brings about a, a fight or flight response. It brings about an adrenaline rush. And, and that's the most common way that we, that we think about fear. That is happening here in this text. But also in this verse, I think we see a deeper fear, a different kind of fear. David writes, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. And that may not impress you at first, but remember that David is God's anointed king, God's chosen king. This is the greater of the fears that David is experiencing. People are attacking his calling as king. They're attacking his character. They're attacking his anointing by God, right? We remember how, how King Saul, the king before David, had sinned. He sinned, and, and God took the kingship away from Saul and gave it to David. God withdrew from Saul. That's the deeper fear that David has in this text. David knows he's done some terrible, terrible things. He's had an affair with Bathsheba and, and arranged for the murder of her husband Uriah. My goodness, how could a man like that be our king? God must have made a mistake with this, with this man. There is a legitimate fear in David that God is going to reject him as the king of Israel. Maybe we might say that the fear of the oncoming armies is an adrenaline-inducing emotion which, which will end after this conflict resolves itself somehow. But I, but I, I think of this fear of being rejected by God as, as deeper and more of an ongoing anxiety in David. It weighs on David. This fear of rejection by God lives on in David. And, and I, so I think there's a distinction that we can make here between these different types of fear. One, one maybe we call fear and the other we call an, an, an ongoing anxiety. Fear is the result of these armies that are coming after him. The anxiety that David is feeling, the worry that David is feeling, is, is deeper. It's more constant. It's based in the idea that God may and probably should reject him. God should turn against him as a result of his sin and his failure in so very many ways. So the, there are different types of fear. There are different levels of fear. When I was on my sabbatical in 2011, I was driving in California between Los Angeles and San Francisco on Interstate 5, which is a super highway, like six lanes of, of traffic in each direction. And I was driving in a lot of traffic, uh, going quite fast, and I was driving north when all of a sudden my car lost all power. It just shut off. There was, there was so much traffic going at such a high rate of speed that I that I couldn't get off onto the shoulder. And I just slowly rolled to a stop. No one would let me in. So I rolled to a stop on one of the, on one of the lanes of, of traffic, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to stay in the car and, 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 and get smashed in by another car, or whether to jump out of the car and run over to the shoulder and just watch the terrible crash that seemed inevitable to me. I was very, very afraid. And suddenly, a young man and woman ran over from the shoulder, over to my car, clearly risking their lives in doing so. And they pushed my car with me in it off to the shoulder. I was so impressed that they would, that they would do that. They knew that I was in serious danger. And they knew, they said, that they had to do something. They saw the danger I was in, and they experienced a, a burst of adrenaline that induced physical energy and mental clarity, and they knew what to do, and they did it, and they saved me. That the actions that they took was based in a healthy fear that they had for me and for my safety. And, and oftentimes that happens, that fear helps us summon up our deepest abilities to do something to protect ourselves or protect something that is important to us. 
Fear that is that specific is good. It keeps us alive sometimes, right? Anxiety, on the other hand, this ongoing fear is not so specific. And it's not uh, adrenaline-inducing. It's more generalized and, and undefined. A fear can lead to bursts of, of energy. Anxiety seems to be more debilitating. It is more abiding in us. It is not a, it is not a fight or flight kind of thing. It stays on all the time. It's, it would lead to ulcers and high blood pressure and depression and sadness. Anxiety is a greater threat to our spiritual lives. It's a threat to our sense of self. We realize we're not in control of our lives as we thought we were. It has deeper roots. It has more spiritual roots. It is something that can be destructive, very destructive. Here's, here's perhaps another distinction that we can make between the idea of fear and what I'm calling for lack of a better word, anxiety, both of which we see in the text. Along with many of you, I am really missing the start of the baseball season. Vander Hartz, I'm looking at you. I, I, am, I, am, I am missing baseball. And I thought about this in sports, fear can be a good thing. An outfielder in baseball will chase down a long fly ball because there is fear that it might go over his head. And that the fear there brings about action and the physical ability to run down that ball. Because if you miss it, criticism will follow, right? You played too shallow. You misplayed that ball. You cost us this game. That's, that's a legitimate fear, a fear of failure. It's a legitimate fear. But, but there's a deeper level of fear that professional athletes face that they all deal with. When they can no longer perform as professional athletes, they begin to experience something different, some anxiety as opposed to that adrenaline-producing fear that, that allowed them, empowered them to chase down that fly ball. Something that was my security, something that was my significance in life, my identity is gone. My status as a professional baseball player is gone. That is some of what's happening here with, with David. Yes, his his body is at risk. Yes, he's being chased down by people who want him dead. That's a legitimate fear. But also, his sense of self, who he is, is under attack. David is facing both of these kinds of fears here in this text. He fears that attack by his, by his enemies, but he fears rejection by God as well. Knowing, knowing that rejection by God would be totally justified given the enormity of his sin, the enormity of his failures in life. And then how does he pray through it? How does he respond to these fears? In, in verse 3, he affirms that God is still with him. He says, you are a shield around me. A shield around me. That's important for us to think about for just a minute. You are a shield around me or about me. We're, we're more familiar with a shield that you hold in, in one arm when you're engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You've seen this. You have one, one arm, perhaps, with a sword or some other, some other weapon in it, and, and the other arm holds a shield, a, a defensive piece of armor. And when someone comes after you with a sword, you use, you use that shield to, to ward off the blows of your opponent, and you use your other arm, the, off the offensive weapon, uh, in a way to harm your, your opponent. That kind of shield that we're holding in an arm is in no way, is in no way a shield around you. There's another kind of shield, though, that David is, is making reference to here. It's, it wraps around you somehow. It surrounds you somehow. It's, it's not for hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's God's protection of you through whatever life may bring to you. You are a shield around me. That's the assurance. You are a shield around me. And here, here's what David is saying, I think. You're shielding God. Your protection works if, as I remain in relationship with you. It works as I abide in you. It works as I go forward with you. It works as I follow you. It works as I stay within your protection for me, your will for me. 
That the shield that David is talking about is of no help if, if you're running away. David is praying, God, bad things are happening to me, but I know that you will protect me if I go forward with you. It won't work if I go backwards. It won't work if I run away. Your, your protection works as I go forward with you, as I remain with you, as I abide in you. I'm staying within the shield. Jesus himself was one time very frightened. He was sweating as if blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was frightened. He, he should have been. It was right to be scared. The will of God, the call of God, was going to take him into unbelievable pain and suffering and death. He stayed within the will of God. He stayed within that shield of God. In the, in the second part of verse 3, David says, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. You are my glory. I'm scared, but you are my glory. David, David here is speaking about that deeper level of fear because he knows that the things that he's based his life on, based his identity on, based his significance on are at risk. Here's a man who gets up every morning and says, oh, it's good to be king. Or I'm, a, or I'm a good father. Or I'm a righteous man. That illusion is over. Adultery and murder. The, the word glory means, means weight. It means substance. It means significance. What he was saying was, these were good things, and I had located my glory in these things. Being a righteous man, being a good father, being a good king, I had located my security in them, my identity in them. It's a good thing to be talented at something. It's a good thing to have a spouse who loves you. It's a good thing to have children that you're taking care of. It is a good thing to be a professional athlete. It is a good thing to be a college professor, whatever. All of these things are good. But if you locate your glory or your significance or your identity in them, what, what you've done is you've put your security and your identity in, in something other than God. They're finite things, and finite things are vulnerable to the circumstances of life. We fear losing them. They're at risk, and so that, that brings about fear in us. And much of the fear that we experience today is that kind of fear. Things that we have made especially important in our lives are at risk today. David is examining his heart. He's looking deeply into his heart. And so, why am I this anxious? Why am I this fearful? It's because I have located my significance, my glory in things that are good, but now they're at risk, or now they're gone. I feel like I'm falling. I, I'm, I'm anxious. I, I'm going to relocate my glory. So it's not their approval that I'm after anymore. God, it's your approval that's my glory. I'm not serving them. I want to serve you. It's not their love that I'm after. It's yours. That's the course that Jesus chose for himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He continued to follow God through the fear. And then, and then David writes, you are the lifter of my head. That is an, that is an amazing statement. This is, this is pretty great. Even today, lifter of your head means what? It means you're proud, right? You lift up your head when you're confident, when you're, when you're proud. A lifter of your head is someone who says to you, I'm proud of you. Hold your head up. Hold your head up high. You're great. That is a lifter of your head, someone who does that in your life. And David has relocated his pride, not in himself, and not in what he has accomplished, but in God. Yeah. Yes, I killed someone. Yes, I, I committed adultery. I'm a failure as a father. I'm a failure as a king. I'm a failure as a man of God. I'm a failure as a human being in all of these ways. And we're, we're scared, we're fearful to the degree we've put our glory, our significance in something that can die or something that can prove out to be a lie. 
And given all that terrible sinful history of David, given all of that failure of David, how in the world can he think or know that God is proud of him? How can he possibly think that? How could he possibly know that? He says in verse 4, I will cry to you and you will hear me. I, I have confidence you will hear me because you are answering me from your holy hill. From your holy hill. I have confidence in God's love and affirmation because of this holy hill. What is this holy hill? The, the tabernacle was on Mount Zion. The place, the place of sacrifice was on that holy hill. You're the lifter of my head. David doesn't know yet what you and I know today, what we know about the holy hill. We know Centuries later, how God accomplished this, darkness descended on Calvary's hill, and Jesus Christ, as Isaiah said, was cut off from the land of the living. He was the ultimate and final sacrifice for our sin. He was sacrificed for us so that we can, in fact, know that God is proud of us, that we can know that God loves us. We can know that God values us like that. The cross of Jesus Christ means that nothing can change that reality. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the lesson of the cross on the holy hill. That's the lesson of the sacrifice that God made for us in Jesus Christ. And you, look at, you go on and you look at verses 7 and 8, you see that it's not enough that he's dealt with his own fear. He now expands out his view of things. He, he takes a different view of things. Being, being healed or becoming healed of, of his fears, he wants to go out and he wants to, he wants to bring about peace and justice for his people. He says in verse, in verse 8, Deliverance, my deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. May your blessing be on your people. He knows, David knows Absalom is not going to be a good king. David knows that Absalom is not the king that God has chosen for the nation of Israel. He knows that Absalom will not serve the people well. And, and, and David realizes and says, I'm not going to finally overcome my fears unless I see myself with, again within the community. I, I need to deal with my fear in community. I care about my people. I love my people. God, God you have restored my peace Let's go forward and let's work for your people. Let's work for justice, peace. May your blessing be on your people. The opposite of fear, the Bible says, is love. And the opposite of love is, is fear. 1 John 4, 8, perfect love casts out fear. You know, we think that the opposite of love is, is hate. But the opposite of fear is, is, is the opposite of love is fear which means that our fears are based in, in our selfishness. Fears are based in our self-centeredness, that mindset. Love, on the other hand, is self-giving, self-sacrificing. And so we, 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 we don't deal with our fears all by ourselves. We're called to love others. We're called to get our minds off of just ourselves. We, we have to stop, stop thinking about our little needs. We need to broaden our outlook on life. And to see ourselves and to see our need in, in community and not in isolation from each other. We need to begin to pray together. May your blessing be on your people, on us together. The only way to finally destroy fear is in community. It's in love. Jesus Christ sweated in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was frightened, but that did not stop him. He followed that thread out onto the cross and into the grave because of his love for us, because of his love for God's people. And, and, and we know this. It wasn't a dead end. There's a resurrection on the other side of that grave. And, and there will be a resurrection on, this other, on the other side of this fear that we have. Do we fear today? I do as well. We will get through it. 
we will get through it together in community. We're in this together. We go through fear together. We'll suck it up. Let's relocate our glory in Jesus Christ. Let's look to him again as our substitute. And let us continue to think of others. God promises to bring us through. God will lead us through our fears. God will heal us of our fears. Let's pray together. Father, we need your reality in our lives. So I ask this morning that you, that you make yourself real to us as your people in Grace Church. I pray that we might say, Lord, become real to us, so real that you become our glory, our significance, our identity. Become more real to us, your people. There are a lot of the rest of us who believe that in the abstract, but it's not so much a reality to us. Make yourself and your love for us more real to our hearts. And may that love today cast out our fears. Amen. As we meditate on that message this morning, sing with us, O oh God, our help in ages past. I've chosen this uh, responsive uh, litany from Isaiah 25, 6, 6 through 9. I'd ask you to read it with me. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And, and he, he will, will destroy, destroy on this, this mountain... mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Receive God's parting blessing. God, go before you to guide you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to support you. God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. Let the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you, settle in around you, and make its home in you. Do not be afraid.
go in peace. Amen. Let's go out rejoicing, singing, we've come this far by faith. Jesus, and we'll see you this time next week. Two.